Hey, how's it going? We're continuing on with our series on P1A visas for internationally recognized athletes. And right now we're on part four, a very important part, especially to our firm and actually something that we are entering already in litigation for to make sure that we hammer it home to USCIS on their own regulations of how to properly adjudicate um, agent-based petition structures. So there are a few petition structures out there. And when I say petition structure, that means who's the employer, what type of um, uh, authority they have on the petition, and also what type of third parties do you have to or not have to get authorization from to file the petition. And of those uh, petitioner structures, there's four that are commonly used. The first one is direct employer. That means that um, this entity is going to be directly paying and putting the athlete to work. Example, uh, the Charlotte Hornets draft a, a foreign national. They are going to be the direct employer of that athlete and also be putting on the events that the uh, athlete is going to be participating in. The second one is U.S. agent petitioner. Now, and there's two different types of, well, three different types of U.S. agent petitioner we're going to get into. One is just U.S. agent petitioner with nothing fancy. Under this structure, um, the athlete, the, the, the U.S. agent petitioner is kind of assumed to be filing on behalf of multiple employers. That means not only does the athlete have to show that they have contracts coming from multi, you know, an employer or multiple employers, but those contracts athlete actually have to show that those employers are okay with the agent serving as the petitioner. I'll give an example. Um, usually this happens more in O-1 visas for like an artist or a um, actor. They'll have an engagement with Netflix, an engagement with shooting a movie with Sony or something like that. And they'll have um, their agent, basically their talent agent serve as their petitioner, the person that signs the forms. But it's going to be Netflix, Sony, and the other movie project that actually are their employers. So they would go get those deal memos, which are the other word for contract in those um, uh, industries. And they would all kind of lay out the terms of what they will be doing with that foreign national, and then also saying that they're okay with that talent agent serving as the petitioner. And of course, the problem here, or it's, it's not a problem, it's just very cumbersome um, to get all those authorizations. And, some, and a lot of times that doesn't correlate well to athletic competitions to like say where you're not currently signed to a um, a sports promotion, but you want to come to to compete in those. And also you might just want to be independent where you're not tied to a certain promoter, but you want to come and be available to fight for multiple uh, promotions using that same petition. And that's what we can do under the other two petition uh, structures that we use a lot and highly advocate for. The first one is U.S. agent functioning as the employer. So what we're saying here is that this agent isn't just standing back. This agent is actually directing and navigating the career of the athlete when and where they will compete. And under this structure, there is no requirement to get those third-party authority sign-offs from the events that they'll be competing in. Let me say that again. There's no requirement for you to be contractually signed to those uh, events that you plan to compete in. In some sports, this is very straightforward, such as track. You usually don't have a contract with the meets that you're going to participate in. So it's pretty much understood that you don't need to show contracts with those. You need to show that the events that you plan to participate in are going to be very high level and that um, you, know, you have a high ranking, which they just kind of assume that you're going to be competing in those. But where it might become more problematic is, say, for example, uh, if you're a basketball player and you say, hey, I'm unsigned, but I plan to come compete in the NBA, but you don't have an NBA contract. Theoretically, if you have an agent that is trying to find you basketball opportunities 
and they're directing and navigating where you're going to play saying like, Hey, I negotiate on their behalf with these teams to get them to play. Then under theory on the structural side of it, you don't need to have a sign off from the NBA or the teams uh, saying that um, you have a contract and that you are permitted to use this agent petitioner. Now where that can come into to play is under um, uh, just proving that you're actually going to be playing for them. And so, you know, it might be hard to say like, Hey, yes, I'm going to play, be playing in the NBA, but you don't have a contract with the NBA. And it's typical that most people that play in the NBA actually have a contract, but it's not in the regulations that the contract has to be in there. That contract is just proof that you'll be actually competing in those competitions, but there's other ways to show more than likely or not, you're going to be competing in competitions, even if you don't have a direct relationship with them. Another example, mixed martial arts. We do a lot of visas for unsigned mixed martial artists that want to compete in the UFC and the PFL and Bellator and other major robust petitions, but they don't have a current contract with them. But their petitioner might be one of the biggest sports agencies in the world in that industry that regularly sends people there. So we can get um, show proof that, hey, this agent has a proven history of directing and navigating athletes to go compete in these events. This is proof that they more likely or not will be competing in these events. And so when we're using the agent functioning as the direct, I mean, as the, um, as the employer, in theory, we do not need a contract or third-party authorization from the events that they'll be competing in. And that's something that... Um, can become a hit or not even a hit or miss. We're supposed to be winning on that, but sometimes USCIS needs to be educated a lot on how that works, but almost all the time it gets through. The other one that's even, you know, sometimes cleaner than the agent functioning as an employer is the US agent for foreign employer. That means there's somebody overseas that's, uh, that's technically employing the athlete to come through this U.S. visa agent to compete in events. And that's another type of structure where there's nothing under, rela- under the regulations that requires um, third-party contracts with the events that they plan to compete in or uh, authority to show that they're okay with the athlete using a U.S. V- visa agent. We just have to show that the foreign employer, the U.S. visa agent, and the athlete all have an understanding. And that is a great structure for unsigned athletes to use to come to the United States to compete in, in whatever competitions, multiple promoters, um, you know, uh, things that they plan to uh, compete in, but they're not signed in yet. Because under the regulations, it doesn't require those third party authorizations. And it's even cleaner than using the U.S. agent for foreign employer because U.S. agent functioning as the employer, because there's no question about like, are they actually functioning as the employer? There's a foreign employer there. And the foreign employer doesn't have to be a promoter. For example, we've used the spouse of an athlete before, the cousin of an athlete before. There's just a lot of ways um, to get that done. And those are the four primary structures that we use. And I'm actually going to share my screen right now to kind of show you, um, to show you this. So um, here is one of our websites, and this is something we wrote about like under the O1 and O1B categories, but the structures are still the same. So here we have direct employer, and you know we just this is what you have to show in that contract or oral consent. And here, no, we know that the itinerary is not as important because either the direct employer has is putting on. Um, competitions that require internationally athlete, internationally recognized athletes or they don't. But here you have a contract with the actual entity that's putting on the events. So here we have U.S. agent function, performing the function of an employer. And this one is one where you really have to hammer it home to show that there is a strong argument that the agent is actually functioning as the employer because they are directing and navigating where, when, how, who the athlete will be competing against. And this is uh, something that's very common in combat sports where it might behoove the athlete to not be tied to a certain promoter. So all of the options are available to them at all times. And then finally, there is 
U.S. agent filing on behalf of foreign employer. So there we have the foreign employer, which again, that doesn't have to be a business. That could be the spouse of the athlete, a cousin, or somebody like that, that's uh, using this U.S. visa agent to, to file the petition. And under this structure, again, there's no regulatory requirement for there to be authorization from third parties, whether it be contractual relationships or authority to use a U.S. visa agent. In our opinion, this is one of the cleanest, the cleanest structure out there for um, unsigned athletes. So that's something that's very important to pay close attention to. And um, in our petitions, it's one of the most highly competitive uh, parts of the petition that we deal with. And we are getting in federal litigation to get it documented that we have it right. And USCIS needs to be consistent with applying the regulations as they're stated when it comes to the structure of the petition.